Hi, welcome to Heart of the Home. Um, today we're going to be learning about God's presence in our life. We're also going to be making a wonderful meatloaf and twice baked potato dinner for you. Um, My heart, your heart, Hi, ladies. We're going to be in Psalm uh, 139 today. Open your Bibles, and we're going to be reading, um, actually kind of listening to verses 13 through 16, but going through it, really, the whole thing. So verses 13 through 16 say, For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my, mo my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. The days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you and praise you for this time. We ask, Lord, that you would go before us. Father, um, search our hearts, Lord. Father, I pray that you would prepare us for your word and your lesson, Lord. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. About two weeks ago today, but will be about a month when you guys see this, um, I celebrated my birthday. And the Lord reminded me in the midst of Psalm 139. So I went back to it and reread it and was so overwhelmed with who he is. And let me just briefly sidetrack here for a minute because for my birthday, I went out to lunch with a couple girls, a few girls, and one of them I drove with, uh, Shirley. And most of you at church know Shirley very well. And we share the same birthday. And so we were talking about that, and she was talking about what the Lord was sharing with her on her birthday. And I cannot believe it, but she said he had pointed her to Psalm 139 and how important it was, and she started talking about it. And I just started laughing, and she looked at me like, what? And I said, that's exactly what I'm teaching on, Shirley. I said, that's what the Lord gave me, and I just finished it yesterday, the day before we went out to lunch. And she goes, I can't believe that. We were both just tickled. And I said, you know, that's the way the Lord does things, isn't it? And she said, yes. And I said, he's just showing us that that's really a birthday psalm. Um, it is a psalm about God's continual active presence with us wherever we go, day or night. He is our creator. He is the potter. He is the artist. He is the designer. He is the sculptor. He is the craftsman of our lives. He alone formed our every part, our heart, our blood vessels, our brain, our muscular makeup, our bones, our hair color, our eye color, our unique one-of-a-kind DNA. But he did not just form us. He meticulously, thoughtfully, intently, miraculously, skillfully wrought us to be who he decided we are to be. That is what scripture tells us. The dictionary says, wrought is worked into shape by an artist, elaborately embellished, ornamented. These are man's definitions. Think how much more the reality of God's work is. He endearingly calls us the apple of his eye. With God in your world, you are never an accident or an incident. You are a gift to the world, a divine work of art, and better still, a signed work of art by God himself, more valuable than anything else. We have never been a blob of tissue, an afterthought, or a mistake. God does not make mistakes. He makes us to be fearfully and wonderfully made. Before even our mothers knew we existed, God already had our days numbered, which he knew our beginning to our end and everything in between. Christ in me means that God knows everything about me. He knows when I sit down and when I stand up, Psalm 139.2. He knows my name, Isaiah 43.1. He knows how many hairs I have on my head, Luke 2.23. 
2, 7. He knows my words completely, even before they are spoken, Psalm 139, 4. In fact, he saw me when I was being formed in my mother's womb. He was there knitting me together, Psalm 139, 13 through 16. Indeed, such knowledge is too wonderful, too lofty for any of us to fully comprehend. Psalm 139, 6. The unbelievable God of ours has a plan for us. How do I know? Because in Psalm 139, 17 and 18, it says, How precious are your thoughts, God, of me. How great is the sum of them. If I could count them, they would be more in number than the sand. That, ladies, is more than every beach in the world. Under the water of every beach in the world, all the riverbeds of the world, the Sahara Desert, all deserts and all the places in the world that hold sand. That is beyond our ability to count. But God, who is faithful and true to his word, says that his thoughts of us are more than all these. We are indeed precious beyond measure in his sight. We are his works of art created in his image to do good deeds. We are significant not because of who we are, but because of whose we are. God has the right to plan our lives because of who he is and what he has done, fashioning us in the womb. A life that brings glory to God is a surrendered life. Our pastor explained this to us a couple weeks ago in his teaching of the compromising church in Revelation. It is a life that operates in the center of his will that brings glory to him. Ephesians 2.10 tells us, We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, that which we should walk in them. You will never regret life surrendered to Christ, a life that glorifies him and points others to him. On the other hand, if you do not surrender your will, your way, your heart to God, you will always be lacking in the best that the Lord has for you, and you will never successfully point others to him. The question today then is, How are you living your life right now? What is your life saying to others? We are indeed that masterpiece hanging on the wall for all to admire. But when I have gone to museums and walked around seeing the great works of art, looking for famous artists, I am sometimes very confused and sometimes appalled at what is called a masterpiece. I wonder if our lives, our portraits, have confused or even appalled those who are interested in the artist named Jesus. You see, ladies, we're not just responsible for our own lives. We represent the master. We represent to this lost world who Jesus is. They should, beyond a shadow of a doubt, see us from afar and be drawn to the artist's touch on our lives and even stand in wonder and curiosity as they figure out what the master had in mind. Because as you know, we are all made in his likeness, but we are not cookie cutter made. He has given us each our own special gifts, so we glorify him. That's what I love about Psalm 139. It perfectly describes his very active presence in our lives. From the absolute beginning and how he alone formed us into those very unique, different, gifted women we are. You are his masterpiece. His perfect touch is all over your life for his glory. So let me ask you a question. What evidence of God's signature do you see on your life? If you're having trouble seeing his signature, it could be you've forgotten who made you and why he made you. At the end of Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, it says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Have you given your heart fully over to the one who made it? Try me and know my anxious thoughts. Are you troubled and anxious today? And see if there's any wicked way in me. Are you in sin? Have you strayed from the master's touch? Have you put anyone or anything in God's place in your life, in your heart? And lead me in the way everlasting. Yes, Lord, lead me to you that I might have everlasting life. I pray that all of you would take the time to read and meditate on this awesome psalm. It is a perfect birthday scripture, but it's also a perfect reminder every day of who made you and why it is so important to glorify him in your daily life. Something uh, touched my heart this week, and I thought it was something I needed to add. A little bit off the subject, but not much. I would love to encourage those of you who may be in bondage to what others may say or think of you, struggling not to take these thoughts captive. 
Remember that you're a child of the king. You have only him to answer to. Make sure that you allow God to search your heart daily. If there is change needed, do it. The enemy would love for us to get bogged down in the muck and mire of self-pity and keep us from the freedom of complete surrender to Jesus. In his presence, there is perfect peace and joy. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, Casting down imaginations in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I wanted to close with something Anne Graham Lotz wrote recently. It should remind us that our time is short and we should be thinking on the importance of our salvation and the salvation of those around us. This is called the Ark of Safety. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Lord Jesus, our, in Jesus Christ, our Lord, Romans 6.23. She says, And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. The offer God extended to Noah was an invitation to be saved from the judgment that was coming. God has also told you and me that judgment is coming. Physical death that ushers us into eternity where our sin has condemned us to hell. Hell is a place of intense, unending physical suffering, darkness, dissatisfaction, and worst of all, separation from the one for whom we, are, we, are, we were created. At the same time God warns us that judgment is coming, he issues an invitation to come into the ark he has provided as the means of salvation from it. Jesus Christ is the ark in which we hide, our Savior from the storm of God's judgment. Have you accepted his invitation to come? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for this day. We ask that you would bless us, Lord, um, keep us, and Father, turn our eyes towards you. And Lord, I especially just uh, thank you and praise you for this birthday psalm you gave to us. And we thank you in Jesus' name. And by the way, ladies, very quickly, I did want to say at the very beginning and forgot that um, what I am wearing today <laughs> was given to me by my, my twin sister, my earrings, my blouse, and I just wanted to give her a shout out. Love you, Lynn. God bless you, ladies. Bye-bye. Hi, welcome back. We're here. We're going to make the meatloaf today and twice baked potatoes. This meatloaf recipe is really good. For the, all of my life, I've made meatlo meatloaf, honestly. Um, it was my first very brownie badge that I got, very first brownie badge, um, making dinner for my family. And the dinner was meatloaf, meatloaf and baked potatoes and green beans. So I have been making it for many, many years. But this is the first time I have felt pretty confident about it because I've always made it with just adding things in here and there and kind of just doing my own thing. This recipe from Ina Garden um, is everything is measured for you. And when I made it the first time, it just came out so, uh, the flavors were just so good. So I hope you try it. If you're one of those people that, oh, I don't want to make meatloaf, you know, first off, it's one of the least expensive dinners to make. It can be made ahead of time, put in the fridge, and then taken out and ready for the oven in the afternoon. And it's just uh, uh, one that can be used um, the next day for meatloaf sandwiches or whatever. So I hope you try it. Just try it once. If you don't like it, throw the recipe out. Um, but I think you will. The twice baked potatoes, I don't think anybody out there is not going to like these. These are like crazy. But we're going to get to those in a few minutes. Let's go ahead and make the meatloaf. Now, when I started, I already went ahead and, and grilled our onions. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she tells us to um, do them to a point of translucent, but not brown. So uh, you guys, um, it says on here, you know, five to eight minutes or so. Um, that's about all it takes, really, before it gets to the point where you're just about right. Now, it also says, and the reason why I did go before you and, and do it is because then not only does it take five to eight minutes to cook, but then you have to cool it because it's going into your raw meat and you don't want to cook your meat before it goes in the oven. So you want to cool it all down. I've already added, because it says directly after the heat, add your Worcestershire sauce, your tomato um, paste, and your chicken broth. So I've already done that. And this is what it, this is what it looks like. 
I'm sure you can see that. David's got cameras all over. But um, anyways, and then you let it cool, which it is cooled right now. So we're going to set it aside. Before we go on, though, I wanted to tell you something of a new trick that I learned, which I was really excited about. Um, if you're one like me who cuts onions and by the end of it, your mascara is down here because you're like, <laughs> you know, um, I found this on, I think it was on YouTube. Anyways, it just came up one day and it was a trick not to tear up with the onions. And I've tried all kinds of things. I've closed my nose. I've closed my eyes trying to do it. Um, but they said that onions, the juice of the onion is actually attracted to water, which is why the eyes water immediately. And so they said, put a cup of water or a bowl of water next to you when you're cutting the onions and you'll never have that problem again. I'm telling you guys, I mean, I was, I was like, no, this really isn't true. This really can't be happening. It was. I didn't have any kind of crying at all. It really worked. So I'm going to keep trying it. We'll see. But for right now, it looks like it's a winner. So anyways, just a tip for you. Okay, so we've got our meat. I've got a little bit more than a pound. It calls for a pound. I've got a little bit more than a pound. No big deal. I just had it wrapped up that way. Um, so I have lean ground beef and um, a little bit of uh, ground sirloin, which is very lean. Um, I would prefer ground chuck because I really love the flavor of ground chuck, but one of our stores doesn't carry ground chuck. So this is what I have. So anyways, um, we're going to go ahead and just pop all of this in there. And what's really neat is these onions are already grilled, sorry, and have flavor um, like crazy already in them. So that's already giving us the flavor. Um, you also put um, your seasoned salt, your um, uh, pepper, and what else is it? Um, Let's see. Oh, and your dried thyme. Your salt, your black pepper, and your dried thyme. I'm sorry, not seasoned salt. I'm getting two recipes mixed up. Let me put this over to the side so you can see it a little bit better. Um, so there's our onions already, our Worcestershire, Worcestershire sauce, our tomato paste, and our broth along with our seasonings. Now, what we're going to add to that is two um, scrambled already scrambled eggs and she says to extra large I think I have extra large so I use that um, if you don't it's not that big of a deal um, it's not a deal breaker by any means so use just two eggs unless you've got the small or medium then I'd use three but anyways then we've got a quarter cup of um, let's see is it a quarter yeah quarter cup of plain dry breadcrumbs and I just noticed on my recipe for you that I didn't put cup next to that, but I'll go in and change that. So now what we're going to do is mix it. Now, I'm going to put my gloves on. You know me and my gloves because we're going to get our hands really dirty and sticky. And so, and you don't want to move this a lot. You don't want to like, um, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to, uh, what do you call it? Um, you know, when you're doing bread. Um, just really getting in there. You're not going to want to do that because the meat then becomes tough and you want to just um, do as much as you can quickly. And then we're going to shape it and put it on our pan that's prepared with parchment paper. So we're going to take our meat and we're just going to make sure that we're getting everything in there and we're not going to really play with it much. We're just going to get it in as best we can, kind of folding it more than anything. And you're going to make sure all the meat is um, mixed in with the seasonings and the flavors, all of that. And it's a, it's a much wetter recipe than I have ever done because I always thought you kind of had to make it dry, but it actually comes out so moist and delicious. So don't, don't worry if you feel like it's a little too wet. As long as it's moldable, it's fine. My gloves are falling off. Um, so that's all. That's all I'm going to do is just that right there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take our pan and it's already got parchment paper on it. You can line it with tin foil the pan first if you think you're going to 
make less of a mess. But I did that the first time I did that and it didn't make that much less of a mess. So I'll just wait until it solidifies a little bit and then I'll just take a paper towel and wipe it all out and then clean it. So just so you know, you can do it either way. Um, so what I'm going to do is pop this in the middle, just like this. This is something new for me too. I usually use um, a bread pan or bread mold, you know, bread pan. And um, put that down. And you just mold it into um, even shape. What I mean by that is you're cooking the meat. So you want it as even a rectangle as you can so that it evenly cooks in the oven. And do you see that? It's just real, um, you know, it's not all mixed together like, I don't know, like really thick and mixed together. It's real moist and looks yummy. So that's our meatloaf. We're ready for that. In the meantime, before I put this in the oven, um, I wanted to show you how to bake your baked potato. Now this is something that I do. You can bake it any way you want it, but this is what I do. Now I would do it normally separate um, to um, the meatloaf, but I've already done some, so they're ready. So I'm just gonna pop this in the oven as an extra potato. But I just wanted to show you how to prepare it. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna poke it a couple times on either side. And that lets the steam escape from the baked potato so that it doesn't actually pop on you because the steam can actually make it pop. So I just do it a couple times. And I have even, I've even seen some people say they don't believe that actually is necessary, but I've done it all of my cooking life, so I continue to do it. Now, I'm gonna put another glove on because I'm gonna make a mess here again. So, you know me, my gloves, my gloves. <laughs> um, anyways, all you're gonna do is you're gonna put a little bit of olive oil, just a little, because that's all you're gonna need on top. Whoa, that was a lot more than necessary. It came out faster. But, and you're just gonna wrap that potato up in all that oil. And um, now the next thing you're gonna do, put this up a little far, sorry, is use kosher salt on top of it. And you don't use, a, you don't need to use a lot, but it does flavor the skin. And if you're one of those people that likes to eat the skin afterwards, you wanna put a little bit of flavoring on it. So you're just gonna pop a little bit of the sea salt, I'm sorry, not sea salt, kosher salt on it. And um, okay, so I just put it in its own little boat just so that the meat wouldn't, um, the meat juices and fat wouldn't go crazy on it. But this just goes on a, on a baking pan and you bake it at really basically the best temperature to, to bake a potato at is 400 degrees for about an hour and it comes out absolutely perfect and beautiful. This one is going in at 325 because we're more interested in getting the meat done than we are the potato. So um, that's what we're gonna do. And we're just gonna put that just like that, just so that it's, you know, safely away from all that grease and stuff. And we're gonna go ahead and pop this in the oven. We'll be right back, okay? All right, welcome back. Um, well, as you can see, I've already made two potatoes and cut them in half. I've already taken most of the meat or pulp or whatever you want to call it out of the three tomatoes. I wanted to show you how to do this with this one. So what you're going to do is you're going to cool your potatoes down, you know, and then you're going to keep about a quarter inch edge all the way around the potato so that you're not going to break the potato when you refill it. Um, you want that edge to keep it um, standing up when it's cooking and whatnot. So, um, so what I'm doing is basically just creating an, a, like a um, canoe. <laughs> that's what I always think of. They look like canoes. So that's it. So all four of those are done. The pulp is in here. So with that, I got my hands dirty, you guys. <laughs> no. um, anyways, with that, we're going to go ahead and add all of the good stuff that goes back into these. And uh, ladies, let me just tell you beforehand, this is not a diet potato at all. So we're going to go ahead and add 
um, six tablespoons. Actually, this is for four baking potatoes. I'm only doing two, so I've halved it. So that's just um, three tablespoons of butter. And um, it would be better if it were warmer, if you didn't right out of the oven, um, because the butter would melt easier, but that's okay. So we're gonna go ahead and, and just use our masher to mash that butter in easier, just like that. And now it's all mashed up and ready to go with the rest of the ingredients. Okay, and this is a potato masher or I use it for my pinto beans or whatever needs to be mashed. You know, it's a nice little tool to have. So mix that up, make sure that butter gets in there all the way. And then you're going to add your um, bacon, which is where? Here's the bacon, found the bacon. Um, what you're gonna do is put your bacon in. It's already crumbled and cooked. You know, really easy when you're making bacon for breakfast or something, just make some extra and put it in a baggie. Um, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna add your sour cream, jack cheese, and milk. Now, I already, I already measured my sour cream and milk um, out. And I wanted to sh give you a little heads up, another little tip. When you're adding something like sour cream and milk or sour cream and cream cheese, always do, or I mean milk and cream cheese, if you've got a liquid, always do the liquid first in a measuring cup like this, then add your solid because you don't even, you can just watch it go up to the line that it needs to be. You don't even have to measure it out. So it makes it a little bit easier to measure. You don't have to do two measurings. So that's what I did. I measured my milk and my cream cheese together and now my cheese. And like I said, this is not a diet. So, and if you're gonna make twice baked potatoes, don't think diet, <laughs> don't think, oh, I could use, you know, whatever kind of butter, because I don't know, because I don't use it, and um, light sour cream and all of that stuff. Just just do it. It's not that big of a deal. It's just a once in a, once in a while thing. So you're going to go ahead and make mix that all up, which I've done, and that already looks really good. And then you're going to add your seasoned salt. Now, you can use regular seasoned salt, but um, I bought something new, and I have been dying to use it. So... There's three different flavors. There's regular, there's cheesy, and there's spicy. Um, I'm using the spicy today. I thought that would be neat. But it's called Delicio, and it's bacon seasoning. And it smells just like bacon. It really does. So I am going to use it in our meal today. We will see how it tastes. But all I need is half of a teaspoon, which I thought would just enhance the bacon flavor. So that's what we're doing for ours. So there's our half a teaspoon of seasoning and black pepper. And I like to use cracked black, black pepper. I use, I use a mill when I'm doing my, pe my pepper. And that's it, that's all you have. Now, the other thing is, is you can also um, put this in a piping bag and pipe it in to make it look real pretty if you wanted to. Um, I am not going to do that today. That would just be a lot more of a step to you. So I'm going to go ahead and just fill them and show you what they look like filled. And I'm going to make them real um, full. You might even end up with some left over um, because there's so much extra in it that you might end up with some left over. But you want to make sure that you f you're filling it really full. So what I'm going to do is just fill them all right now and then go back over because I know I'm going to need to put more in there. So just big clumps of, you know, um, spoonfuls of your mashed potatoes in there. You can see how delicious this is going to be. And then I'm going to pop it in alongside our... Um, our um, meatloaf and it's not at the right temp I believe it's 350 
um, yeah, you, you start baking the potatoes at 400 and then you turn the uh, oven back down to 350 to bake them for about 20 minutes. They're going to go in a 325 oven today because of the meatloaf. So, um, so they'll cook a little bit longer, which is fine, something like that, whatever veggie you want. So I'm just going to put these kind of on top, smush them in just a little because I do like green onions on my potatoes. So I'm just going to, I'm hoping that they don't cook too well on top. But that'll be okay. Getting my fingers all dirty just for this. Okay, good enough. Now, these go in um, by themselves if you've already got your meat ready and going or they go in at, with your meat and they'll cook just fine that way too. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, anyways, have a blessed day and enjoy your meal.